it. Here we go. All right. So welcome and thank you all very much for coming out to see me today. Um, I need to give a presentation of who I am before I get this thing started. Um, my name is Jonas Duerask and I'm a Fujifilm ambassador. Um, Fujifilm calls their ambassadors ex-photographers and I have been an ex-photographer for a couple of years. Um, I got invited by Fujifilm Nordic to come and give this talk to you. Um, and I'm really happy to see that so many of you showed up today, which is really great. Um, I Let me start off by saying I'm not a professional photographer. Uh, some of you might know that. Um, I am a doctor. I'm a general practitioner. And I just bought my own clinic a couple of months ago. So all my photography is what I do on the side. But let me just say this, I spend a lot of time doing <laughs> photography. Um, so, but I don't have my primary income off of photography. So uh, that's my entrance into this world. I'm an enthusiast, so you can just label me as such going forward. Um, I have three kids. I live in the second largest city of Denmark called Aarhus, or in a very small town just south of that. I have a very overbearing wife. She's actually here today. She followed me to Malmo, so we had a nice little Christmas walk around the city, which was really great. Um, today, I will be talking a little bit about almost anything that has to do with my photography and uh, Fujifilm X system. I'm gonna start off by just talking a little bit about what got me started, what kind of gear I use, um, and then I'm gonna move into um, what is really dear to my heart, the street photography, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna talk to you about some of the, the, the cameras from Fujifilm, the X-T2, the X-Pro2, and also a little bit about the GFX. And then we are gonna round this thing off with some real geekery stuff uh, about vintage lenses on the Fujifilm system, which is something that I have enjoyed since starting, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the technique behind it and all that uh, at the end. In the beginning, there was light, right? And then there was the X100 for me. Um, it all started back when I got my, when we were having uh, our firstborn child, and I wanted to document. Uh, her upbringing, uh, and I didn't want to do that just using my uh, iPhone. So I went out and I bought a DSLR, uh, I bought a Canon, Canon system, and the whole point of that was to, to document her everyday life, right? The problem was that it was too big for, for just carrying around, so I never really got around to doing that. So I always ended up carrying the iPhone, and never really got around to taking the images that I that I really wanted. I started shooting a little bit uh, just uh, documentary stuff uh, on the side of, of, of just doing the the family stuff um, but not really much I got I got bored quite quickly so um, then in 2011 uh, Fujifilm announced the uh, X100 and I saw it on in online magazines and I s and I, I talked to my dad, who was also a hobby photographer, about it. And one day I was in the local photo store in, in Aarhus. And um, yeah, I bought one. Uh, money was tight in, in educational support. But I mean, it wasn't a Leica, so it wasn't that expensive, right? Um, so I bought one and I took it out. And I took it directly to the streets. And I mean, I had played with it for, I don't know, 10 minutes. And I didn't know what all the manual controls were about, and I didn't know anything about it. So what I did was just shoot some frames, and I shot more frames, and then I got home. And then I loaded the files into my computer. And it had been set to the Velvia film simulation. I didn't know that there was anything called film simulations in the camera. So it was just the way the JPEG looks. Uh, or looked, I was, I was really, really, really surprised and really stunned that I could get these colors just off the camera. And then I started just carrying with me and we took it, or I took it with me everywhere and 
the next thing that impressed me was the, the low light capabilities of it. I was used to going to ISO 800 on the Canon and then that was it. It was an old EOS 450 or something, so not much room there. Um, so <coughs> the, the, the 3200 ISO files just looked incredible and it meant that I could just carry it with me everywhere and didn't have to use the flash and um, it was so small and pocketable, so I just used that, okay? Um, and then a year after, uh, or something, a little more than a year after, uh, Fujifilm announced the X-Pro1. And by then I was completely smitten and I just thought, okay, I need to go get this. So I bought that one as well. Um, and I bought it with a 35mm f1.4. Um, I actually molested mine <laughs> and, and, and used sandpaper on it to, uh, I don't know why, I had a boring weekend uh, some months ago. Um, but what I started doing with this was uh, I started researching that you could, uh, you could adapt the vintage lenses, which I'll be talking to you about a little later. Um, so this was a completely new market because I could go to flea markets and I could just pick up a lens, pay 25 Danish kroner for it, and ju then just mount it, and then I could just shoot images, which was incredible um, for a poor student like myself. So um, that was my kit for the next couple of years, just the X-Pro1 with the 35mm and all the vintage stuff, and then my X100. I still, to this day, bring a camera with me everywhere I go. And if you ask the friends of my kids, they think that I'm the weirdest guy in our small town, I think, because I always carry a camera. Um, but I still do. What the Fujifilm cameras made me do uh, over the course of a couple of years or, or, or the first year was it made me just slow down. It made me just look at the world the way I needed to look at it. It just made me focus on the subject matter and not about the technique. Um, it's a very manual approach. You need to set your aperture, you need to set your shutter speeds, you need to... It's a very manual approach and you don't have to go into menus at all. Almost. And then again, the first iterations of these cameras were so painfully slow to autofocus <laughs> that I simply... <laughs> I had to slow down because that was all I could do. Um, but what has happened since with Fujifilm the last five years, it's, only, it's actually only been five years, um, is kind of amazing and incredible. Because what they've done with the software in their cameras, they updated them. I mean, version one of the X-Pro2 firmware was horrible, but version three is amazing. Um, and that's the same thing with all the cameras uh, in their lineup. They keep just updating them um, for them to improve. Now, that was a little bit why I chose uh, the Fujifilm system. But why do I continue uh, to use the Fujifilm system? Well, obviously, now I am an ambassador, so I've, it's a pretty good gig and I'm not going anywhere. So, but there are a ton of reasons. And if some of you has a Fujifilm camera, you can probably um, recognize some of these. And maybe you... Uh, the reason for you to stay with Fujifilm is more of these or, or one of these. But for me, it's kind of all of these and then it's really none of these at all. Because for me, it's about a thing that's really hard for me to describe. And it's, um, it's about a feeling. It's about that particular feeling that you get um, when you have something in your hands that's not just a tool, but it's something that is so, I mean, it, it just becomes quite seamless. So it, it just, it, it really doesn't exist. It's not between me and my subject. It's just something that I use. And that's, that's what the Fujifilm is about for me. I mean, I can try to explain it like this. Some of you, uh, when you, probably when you have some creative stagnation and you, you don't really get the images that you really want, uh, what do you do? You go to Scandinavian Photo and you probably buy new stuff, right? Uh, you buy a new camera, you buy whatever. Um, and what this does is y you have this new piece of gear and you want to test it and you want to use it and then you, you, you get out and you shoot more. Um, and you have this feeling for it that this is, this is a good piece of gear. So, and maybe you get a 
a little place on your nightstand. I don't know, <laughs> but but um, but you 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 tend to use the new gear more. That's the feeling that I get when I pick up a Fuji camera. Not not just the new ones, but just really, the, it just it 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 makes it possible for me to to go shoot, and it 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 inspires me to go shoot. Now, I go shoot mainly on the streets. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, if the pointer will let me. Um, my street photography um, is not classical street photography. Uh, most of you probably know uh, great street photographers of the genre, um, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Elliot Erwitt, Saul Leiter, um, Margaret Burt White, um, to, just to name a few, right? Um, they are the, tr the true pioneers of the genre, and they have a very defined, um, they have a very defined style. I'm not going to define today uh, what I think street photography is, uh, but I know that it's gotten quite a renaissance these past couple of years, um, and the reason for this. I think it's because of cell phones. Because now everyone can just bring along their cell phone and go to the streets and start documenting stuff. And the cameras in the cell phones are actually quite good. So you can actually do great street photography with camera phones. Um, I don't really care what equipment people use when they go out onto the streets. I don't care if they use primes or if they use zooms. Um, I just think it's important to find whatever gear is, is, is great for you, whatever gear that gives you that feeling that I talked about before. What street photography is for me is documentary. I document people. I like to photograph people. I like to, um, to take images of people in everyday situations. Um, and I use the city uh, as a background for that. So. I think of the city as this theater where life is played out and where I can catch the actors um, just involved in themselves or uh, amongst each other, uh, but I never <coughs> intervene. I always make sure to stand back and take my photos candidly. Um, that sometimes changes when I see an interesting personality and then I go up and ask them prior to take their portrait. But that's exactly what it is. That's portraiture. That's me putting my uh, interpretation of that person into the photograph. That's not uh, the scene as it is. So that's a different thing for me. Um, in the beginning, I was a little bit scared uh, of confrontation, so I stepped back. I took steps back and I just focused on strong composition, strong lines, and then making sure that I had human elements within the frame. After a while, I got a little more uh, courageous and I started using wider and wider focal lengths and going closer and closer. Um, so some of my images have a narrative, but not all of them. And to me, they don't have to have a narrative. I don't think all my images need to have a story. I think I can go to the, to the local store or I can go into town and I can just be fascinated by the light that's around me that day. And then I'll just start shooting light. Um, other times I'm more in a storytelling mood and maybe it's a rainy day and you have a very moody atmosphere and then I just go in closer and I try to tell some stories about uh, just surrounding that atmosphere. So it's very different uh, what I do. Um, I usually, now there are of course color photos here, but I usually use black and white. Um, I usually do that because it minimizes clutter. And if I want to use color, I think I need to use it for something. I, I, I want the colors in the images to mean something. Um, because the black and white images are very powerful because then you focus on the subject matter instead of just all the flutter around it. 
I shoot uh, prime lenses primarily, um, the 35 millimeter focal length and the 33 millimeter. And this is, of course, because that's where I started with the X100 and with the X Pro One with the 35 millimeter. I know a lot of street photographers. This is the preferred kind of focal length range, right? 23 for documentary type stuff and 35 if they want to go closer. That's APS-C. If it's it's 35 and 50 millimeter in full frame, but let's not get into that discussion. Um, but. A lot of people, I see them using zooms, and I see them using longer telephoto lenses, which is great. I'm very lucky to get sent uh, gear from Fujifilm from time to time to do reviews of them. And I take them to the streets, these lenses, and I, I just use them the way I think they should be used. Um, and it gives me a little bit of a different approach to street photography. That's why my street photography is sometimes all over the place. It's not really, it's not really genre defined. Um, and it suits me quite well. I think as a general practitioner, I'm used to a little bit of everything. Um, and it's the same thing with my photography, just a little bit of everything. Not really a specialist in, in, in one field, right? I have a couple of shots that I want to single out for you um, because they mean a little bit more to me because there's a, little, <coughs> there's a story behind them. And this one's the first one. Um, I had a half a year uh, hiring just north of the city when I was uh, doing my interns at the psychiatric ward. And I, uh, I drove through town uh, every, every morning uh, when it was dark during winter time. And I saw this, we have this uh, four lane street in Aarhus. And I was always on the wrong side of that street, but I could see the wall and I could see the spotlights. And I just had imagined this image in my head of a person walking through or under these spotlights. But I could, I never had time to stop and I was not the wrong side. But one evening, I th it was winter, February, March, something like that. I was at the cinema with a friend and on my way home, I passed on the right side. So I just thought, okay, this is it. I had my X100 with me. So I just stopped the car and um, okay, and then I just needed to wait. And I mean, Aarhus is not as big as Malmö and on a Thursday evening, winter, around midnight, there are not a lot of people going through that area. So I waited, I took place and I just waited. And I actually waited 45 minutes to get that shot. <coughs> but I got the shot. And what is so great to me about the shot, other than I'm, I was incredibly lucky that her perfect stride just lined up directly beneath the spotlight, which is just pure luck. Um, but what Fujifilm did for me here, or any mirrorless camera, is I had a direct representation of the highlights and the shadows in my frame because I could see it in the electronic viewfinder. I could crush the shadows and get these highlights to, to frame my shot the way I wanted to. And then I just used this genius uh, little thing called the hybrid viewfinder and I switched it to the OVF after I had locked my exposure and then I was just waiting. And then when I could hear the footsteps, finally, I could just see her moving before she even entered the frame. Um, I could see where she was. Um, so I was ready to get that shot when she actually just was in the right place. So I know that I would not have been able to, to make that shot with, with, with a standard DSLR camera. That's, that's, I know that. Another example, I call this one the kiss. Um, I was out on a daily walk, as I am a lot of times in Aarhus and there's this big square in the middle of Aarhus and the only way to get to it is if you walk up these stairs and there's this open place um, and there was this couple sitting there and they were sitting there kissing and they were very involved in each other and I just wanted to document, be, document that but what happened when I walked up the stairs was I had my camera around my neck and everything just screamed photographer right so they just looked like that and went oh what's he doing so I just stopped and then I opened my phone, I opened up the Wi-Fi application and connected to the camera. And I just looked as if I was doing stuff on my phone. And I had it set to uh, a silent shutter and I took pictures of them with my phone and they didn't know. So at first they acknowledged my presence and then they just started ignoring my presence because I was just the weird guy with the phone with the camera around my neck. Um, so I could just continue to take shots of them and they didn't notice and at the end I got the shot that I had seen before walking up the stairs. And I set this 
when I held this presentation at Fotokina, I'm going to say it again, there's a fine line between being a pervert and a photographer here. <laughs> but what I did afterwards was, this is, a, this is the soundest piece of advice that I can give you, is just always carry a business card. Carry a little card with your email address and your website if you have one, and then go up to them. And that's what I did here. Went up to them and said, excuse me, I actually took a picture of you without you knowing because I just thought the situation you were in, I wanted to document it, but you would ruin it if you knew that I was taking the shots. So show them the shots, show them the business card, being upfront about it. And I've done this for five years now, and I've never ever encountered any issues at all doing this. And what you do with this is that suddenly you have their acceptance, and then all the laws in the world, no matter what country you're in, that doesn't matter because you have their acceptance. Okay, So that's a really, really sound piece of advice that I really want to give on. Just always carry a business card and then be upfront about your photography. Just, it's always easier to ask for forgiveness, right? And if people ask you to delete an image, delete it. There's not an image that's worth the confrontation. I mean, come on. It's not like we're professional documentary photographers, or at least I'm not. So, all right. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of techniques that I use for my street photography. This one is a very fancy word. What it actually just means in a fancy way is you can have a couple of information within a given frame that either contrasts each other or adds to each other. That's all there is. What you can refer this to in street photography is you can have something funny happen. You can have Henri Cartier-Bresson called this the decisive moment. It's the moment where everything just kind of makes the perfect situation. I use this in a humorous kind of way. These, these situations, I, I, I spot them and sometimes you have to be really quick about them and see them even a couple of split seconds before they occur. And other times you can just wait, see something and then just let the scene unfold and hope that some of these situations uh, occur. Uh, but I use them for humorous purposes. These, these little, little kind of uh, plot twists in everyday life where we just go, oh, that's, that's a little bit peculiar. So I'm just going to show you some examples, okay? This one's from London. And of course he is not supposed to be sitting there. And this one is from Copenhagen. Uh, we were doing a photo walk and you've probably seen a ton of these images. What I think makes this, I have a ton of these images as well. I always go looking for stripes and then something nice next to the crossing, right? But what makes this image for me is the model pose that she suddenly struck, uh, looking to the right like, like a model, but then of course the stripes match, okay? Again, with the stripes walking past a, a window, and you have to spot this before she walks by the window. This one, I've been walking past that so many times, just wondering when's a little person going to be holding the hand of a big person? And, uh, and there they were. <laughs> this is a great example, I think, of this was taken using the 90 millimeter lens because these horns or wings were actually four meters behind them. So the compression of the scene using a medium tele was actually what made this possible. This would not have been possible using a 35 or a 23. So again, use whatever tools you have and then just take advantage of it. This was from Paris and um, we walked, my wife and I, um, and, and we, we walked past this poster and I was like, the poster of JFK, you don't see that much anymore. And then we went past and I was like, shit, she looks like Jackie Onassis, this one, but Jackie Onassis, she's like Jackie Kennedy. Um, and then I made the instant coupling and that's why the image is so blurred and out of focus, but because I had no chance to set anything in the camera. But the juxtaposition to me is there. It's, it's Jackie Kennedy and, and uh, JFK. <coughs> yep, he could be the killer this one. <coughs> and yeah, you can probably read it. It says, do not, do not place stuff on the wall. And don't put your bicycles here. <laughs> And then again, these little curiosities, there's this Jimmy Cliff cover and uh, the Neil Young uh, book cover and then the guy sitting with the hat. So 
I, I just thought the hats was a common theme. And this one with the two mannequins and the three older models sitting below them and the three for two sign. And then this is maybe a situation where I saw the sign and I really wanted to make an impression that everything was going past really rapidly uh, as a contradiction to the slowness of the sign. And then you, I molded that scene by using a slower shutter speed, of course. So this is, this is my interpretation. Composition. Um, I use different approaches to composition. Uh, I really, I really like, I'm in this phase right now where I'm using sharp contrast. I mean, very sharp highlights and really, really crushed dark shadows. Um, the differences between the two, using them as lines in the images to direct attention uh, towards where I want the viewer to be looking. That's what I'm really looking at right now. But there are a lot of stuff you can use. You can use reflections and you can, um, you can use the, the, the traditional compositional matters like, like placing them the right places in the images and stuff. Um, this one again is, I wanted to single out this guy. So I used the same technique as with the woman walking below the spotlights, just spot metering for highlights and then spot metering on him and all the rest of the cafe company it just fades away so you can direct attention just using light directly to this guy this one again lines and light different between highlights and shadows all direct your attention to what i wanted to single out in the image the the holding of the hands and the the love within that image this one is this is a weird image, and, and without getting too philosophical, this is what I was actually thinking that morning. It was a rainy morning, and I went to work, and this is actually a, 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 a store window where they had uh, put some paper on it to hide the mannequins behind it um, because they were changing the decorations. So the shadows are actually the mannequins, and the reflection you see is from the opposite side where there's a, a phone store, uh, and it had this great big window so when I walked past it looked what I thought was oh this looks like a window into the soul of this guy and I thought okay so what's he thinking rainy morning he's thinking umbrellas right so I just had to wait for someone to walk through and carry an umbrella which was like the next person so again this is my interpretation of the scene but again I was using composition to direct all your attention toward the light spot in the image Um, May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Do you only take one shot or do you take a couple of shots? Mostly one. Mostly one, okay. Mostly one. yeah. Um, sometimes I take a couple. The, the, the girl walking uh, past the spotlights, I have ten of them at home where she's just walking, right? I mean, the same girl walking to take Yeah, exactly. I just, I just took ten shots, yeah. right? Um, but, but usually I take one, maybe two, three, something like that. But never on continuous, on just single shots. So that's, that's my technique. I know a lot of people do it uh, very differently. Um, and I actually, when I was testing out the X-T2, I actually used uh, some of the continuous uh, autofocus and continuous uh, fast burst mode just to see if it would make a difference for me, if I could single out that image. And I found no difference. So, so I just continue using it. Um, what really interested me here was uh, what I saw, the detail that I saw when I walked past here was actually the mirroring of the cross on the, on the floor. Um, but when I got home and looked at the image, what really struck me was this yin-yang kind of feeling where you have this division in half where it's completely black and then it's completely light and then you have her just coming out of the shadow. Um, I can get files that looks almost like this out of the camera by just exposing for highlights and just upping the contrast in camera. But I usually put more contrast on them when I get home. This one I like as well because the light was bouncing off the wall and into his face. So he's actually really well illuminated. So he looks like he's walking alone in the shadow and then the shadow is walking alone in the light. So it looks like it's actually two different uh, individuals walking along. And this one, she was pregnant, she is pregnant. Uh, she, she's probably not pregnant anymore. Um, <laughs> or maybe with a new child, who knows. 
So, but what I had in mind when I took this, and again, I had to be very quick about this because it was a thought that was in my head and just, I had to take that shot, was she might have been carrying a baby boy and the baby boy, as I moved in through the image, got a little older and then he turned into an older gentleman at the back. So it's kind of like a generation going through the images. And this is a, quite a recent image. I call this a study of triangles. I just saw triangles everywhere and the, the lady was triangulating with her own shadow with the sign shadow and the sign was making the shadow and the sidewalk and then you have the black triangle and the light triangle so a lot of triangles in that image. Again, no story, just light and composition which just happened to inspire me that day. <laughs> it's the new Star Wars. <laughs> Don't be afraid of placing your subject in a weird spot in the, in the image. As long as you have lines going through the image uh, that directs your attention, it's probably going to be okay. Because this is, this is not going to win any competitions, that's for sure. Um, but, but again, it makes a little bit of more of an interesting image. And again, there's nothing to it. It's just placing the lady further to the, to the left and then just having the lines uh, direct the attention towards her. And then again, there are a lot of people, especially on Instagram, they have their own hashtag, the Puddlegram hashtag, where they take images of mirrors in the puddles. Um, but you can always use uh, mirrors uh, in the vertical position as well. So uh, mirrors in the street uh, life is always quite effective because it gives a, a, a more interesting image. All right. So I'm going to get a, get a little bit more gear technical now. Um, I've been asked so many times during the last year, uh, which, which camera do we prefer? The X-T2 or the X-Pro2? And I prefer the X-Pro2, simply because it fits my style of photography better. And then it's about that feeling that I talked about at the beginning, the feeling that I get when I pick up that piece of equipment. I don't really get the same feeling with the X-T2. So that's all there is to it. The cameras, per se, are completely identical. They produce the same images. It's the same image quality processor. It's the same sensor. They're identical. They did something, Fujifilm, to divide uh, the two product lines. It became quite evident um, because I think, this is, this is personal opinion, I don't know this, but I think I think Fujifilm was a little bit surprised of the success of the X-T1. Um, so they, they kind of knew maybe they had to cater to, uh, to the segment that really bought into the X-T1 line, but they knew they also had the, the, the photographers that preferred the X-Pro1 and, and the rangefinder type. So when they upgraded the X-Pro2, um, they shortly thereafter, or half a year after, upgraded um, the X-T1 with the X-T2. So now you have two lines uh, of the same cameras but with very different uh, approaches to photography. The m most of the images that I've been showing you so far uh, are taken with the, with the X-Pro2 because that's really the camera that I've been using uh, the most. Um, and that is again because it fits my style of photography. Well, they're both weather sealed, right? Um, but I'm just going to start with the X Pro 2. What makes the X Pro 2 so great? Again, the same with the X100 series is this the, the hybrid viewfinder. For me, this I I know it's not everyone who probably fewer and fewer are using these, um, and it's 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 what makes this camera a little bit more expensive because it's it's actually mechanical and there's a lot of glass in here. Um, what this makes possible is to see outside the frame, sort of like you did in the old rangefinder days with the Leicas, right? You can see outside the frame, see what's happening outside the frame, and then just be aware when it enters the frame. And then if you're a right eye, it only covers half your face, so you can always follow along with your other eye, which makes it really natural to shoot. It also makes it very non-intimidating, because you can always see my face if I'm smiling at you, um, instead of just going like Ugh. Um, it has this charming appearance uh, 
more and more people are getting used to these type of old school retro design cameras. But at the beginning, everyone was stopping me with the X100 or the X Pro One and going, "Oh, is that an old film camera? Oh no, it has a screen." And it, they just look they look charming and non-intimidating in in some sort of way. So it allows you to get closer. And when you want to do uh, documentary photography, that's actually a, quite a, a big benefit. It has really fast and precise autofocus. The autofocus of 2011 is forgotten by now. It, it's fast, it's precise, and it works. At least for my, for my standards. The new sensor, uh, the new uh, 24 megapixel APS-C sensor that was announced when, it, when the camera was announced in, in January, um, it has great dynamic range, and this was one of the test shots I shot last Christmas. Um, I mean, this is a this is a, f a JPEG straight out of the camera, uh, long exposure from a local beach where I live, and just even the JPEG, I can pull out these incredible details out of the shadows, and the raw file is even better. I can really pull some detail out of this, um, and the Fujifilm files they're a little bit overexposed, but that also means that they're really hard to really overexposed. You can, you can salvage a lot of information when you overexpose them. So that's really good. Acros. I could talk to you another night about Acros only. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, I was so fortunate at Fotokina to sit and talk with the guy who was actually the engineer behind Acros. And I think I just sat with my jaw to, my, to the floor the whole time and just listening to what he was saying because this is just my film simulation. I love black and white. And when they made this film simulation, the first thing I saw was just, it had something to the files that I didn't get from my regular black and white simulations that was in the camera before. It has this great ability to, again, not overexpose. It's like, it's like a, a film of some sort. You, you cannot blow the highlights on this one. If, it's really, really hard. You really have to, to go at it to, to blow the highlights. And that's quite <coughs> unique in a, in a digital film simulation. The other thing is that it has uh, a new grain control. It controls the grain um, going through the highlights to the shadows. And the X Processor Pro does this uh, during the capture. So you cannot really emulate the Acros um, after the fact. When you put a RAW file into Lightroom and you apply the Acros simulation, it's not the same. Uh, and I've really been studying this and doing close-ups and pixel peeping and stuff like that. It's not the same. What it does is it analyzes the highlights of the image and adjusts the grain there, and then it analyzes the midtones and adjusts the grain there, and then it analyzes the uh, the, the, the bottom part, the, the shadowy part, and then it adjusts the grain there. And you can actually see it because you have coarser grains in the shadow and then you have finer grains in uh, the highlights. Fujifilm actually made a small article on this on their, uh, on their blog, um, which was great because it kind of, it, it just really, uh, it, it, it just confirmed my findings. Um, because it, it makes, for me, it makes it, it makes it more dynamic to look at. It makes it, it makes a, a rounder file of sorts. So that's why when I'm shooting black and white these days, ever since Acros came along, I'm always using the JPEG and then adjusting that. I'm not using the raw files. Sometimes when I miss the exposure, I use the raw file to, to pull out details and stuff, but mostly JPEGs, 99% or something. This again, just to show the hybrid viewfinder, again, expose, lock down your exposure, crush the blacks, and then just with a flick of a switch, flick it to uh, the OVF, and you can see what's happening in your frame. It's genius, and it's the only camera in the world who has it. Yeah, he's running on water, that one. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the X-T2 because I had the incredible honor of being picked as one of the photographers who got to test this one. Uh, Carl from Fujifilm Nordic phoned me back in March and he asked me uh, if I wanted to be a test photographer or he asked me, he, he had some weird name and I, I googled it 
And I was like, so what is this? Is this a, a kind of collective or what, what is this? What do you want me to do? And he was like, no, no, it's a new camera. We want you to test it. Okay, okay, I'm on, I'm on. So, and then it, then it came in the box and when I unpacked it, I saw that it was because I didn't know that. And then I, I saw that it was the, 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 the successor to the X-T1. I thought, okay, so this is the serious workhorse because now I really need to go to work because the instant thought that I had was I need to test this out like a pro would. I need to test this out in so many different situations so that I could, when I'm writing this stuff, this review or whatever I'm going to do, I want to make sure that I have tested this the way that a professional working photographer would probably do and, and test it in some of the situations that he would probably use it in. So that was the mission statement going into this. The X-T2 is a multi-horse. It, it has um, the same sensor, it's weather sealed, it's, it has these direct controls, the same as the X-T1. Um, and then it has a new fast burst rate and it has a new uh, continuous autofocus system something that has been refined and you can find this is where they they divide between the the x pro line and the xt line uh, because they they keep this autofocus system this this fast uh, continuous autofocus and uh, and especially the the customization of it they keep it to the xt t line um, so it was clear from the beginning that this was a workhorse right um, it has r cross as well so I could still shoot the black and whites and I can still line up my daughter in front of the camera and shoot portraits and she's getting tired of it I think but I'm not stopping. Um, but what they also started doing with the XT line was they announced a new flash system. Uh, the new flash system is able to do uh, high speed synchronization and uh, they announced some changes to the TTL uh, metering and the TTL algorithm. Um, so they're really getting serious about flash use. And I just received a new remote from Nissin that actually can do the TTL stuff um, wirelessly to one of their flashes. And Cactus has announced uh, a system that can do HSS and TTL. And I think this is just the beginning of it. I'm, I think we're going to see a lot of the, the bigger brands, Pro Photo, stuff like that, coming out with adapters and, and, uh, and triggers uh, for, for the system now. This was taken using high speed synchronization. Um, and as you can see, this was bright daylight, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, back in May or June or something like that. And uh, the sun was just coming from above. I actually had a flash from above and then a reflector from the bottom. And this was shot at f1.8 and then one eight thousandths of a second and the flash just synced perfectly. So it gives you great opportunities to just shoot in, in, uh, in backlit situations outside and you can just crush the sky because you can, you can totally open up and, and, and use uh, shutter speeds of up to eight, one eight thousandths of a second. The new speed thing. Uh, I got invited or I pushed to get an invitation to a classic race in, in Aarhus. Um, where they do sort of a Monte Carlo style race where they they have old race cars and then they have these uh, vintage Formula One cars. These are from the uh, Senna and Alan Prost period and stuff like that. The, the real screamers that are so loud that you cannot possibly be near them without having hearing uh, protection on. So these cars were going at me, I was in this corner and they were going at me 200 kilometers an hour. And the fast burst, I just shot 8 frames per second, 11 frames per second, 14 frames per second. And the new algorithm, it just, it, it captured the helmet and it just followed him through the corner. And I have a series where, where out, of, out of 14, I'm missing maybe one. And I have other series where, where it's not missing a single shot. It's just focusing on him. And I have shots at home where I'm shooting through leaves, uh, through the bushes. And it's not even, f it's not even losing the focus. Uh, so it's, it's a really great autofocus system uh, for continuous photos, focus for motorsports. The blackout time from the EVF has also been reduced really, really in, with, a, with an incredible amount. 
uh, so you don't have that blackout period. So when you follow these cars around the corner, you don't have blackout, 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 and then the, corner, the car is gone. It goes blackout, 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 blackout. So you can, you can get a lot more shots and you can see where the car is going. Yeah, just wanted to show some smoke, right? And again, following it through corners, it was easy peasy. I went the whole day just with the battery grip mounted and the long uh, 5140, and it was a heavy piece of kit. Not as heavy as the guys that were logging around to uh, DSLRs. With the, they had back pains. I mean, that's good for my business, so so I'm not complaining. But but when I went to the pit, what I could do was just take off the battery accessory, and I could click on a small 90 millimeter or the small 35 millimeter, and I could get really close because then I was back in the street photography, documentary photography style uh, reported stuff. And this was actually, he was doing some meditation before the race, and this shot is taken with me leaning through the passenger window inside the car, going like this, and he didn't notice me at all. And I don't think, I mean, I don't think I would do that with with the with the bigger cameras, I, I think I would get noticed. I don't know. Um, I wasn't wearing a, a yellow vest either. They, they were black, so maybe I was more more anonymous. I don't know. But then again, it's so easy to log around and take these moody shots. Um, so okay, so that was racing, right? I thought okay, concert photographers might start using this. So I secured myself a spot as a festival photo photographer uh, for one of the local festivals uh, in, in Jutland. Um, and if you think race cars test your autofocus, you should try rock stars in, in, in this kind of environment because they're all over the place. They're so erratically moving, they're all over the place. But I mean, again, it just locks on. And even though the lighting is against it, not a single issue. I could deliver the same 17 files per concert that all the other guys were doing. So I mean, I I don't I don't believe I missed important shots. I don't re I don't really think I did that. Again, com incredibly light and and the focus is great and and across files straight from camera you can deliver stuff like this just out of the camera without having to go through any kind of post processing, which is crazy, right? I really like this detail. This is, this is actually a spot coming from here, going up. But for me, it looks like he took this stream of light and just bended it up like this, which is, of course, not possible for him. So I call this image the light bender. I really like this one. So that was the concert photography. Then I thought, OK, commercial sort of portrait photography. I found some guys that I know that are building these cool cafe racers uh, from Relic Motorcycles. They actually have some pictures that I took hanging out here, which is quite cool. Um, again, the film simulations. This is a Velvia film simulation shot at dusk and no post processing at all. Just this is the stuff you show them on the back of the camera. And when you show clients this on the back of the camera, they go at the color and they just go, OK, let's continue. <laughs> um, so this is a really great feature, the film simulations. Um, again, the great dynamics. You cannot see it here, but I mean, the sharpness of the Fujinon lenses. I mean, you could see a small uh, beard leftovers uh, when you zoom in closely. Um, I was hanging out of my Skoda for this one uh, with the camera in one hand and grabbing on like this and, and going like this. And again, it's a small camera system, so you can do that. You can just balance it with one hand and go into all weird sorts of positions. I used the flip screen, flipped out the flip screen so I could see what I was doing. I think this is the one hanging out there. It's just to show that this is a different film simulation. This is the classic chrome film simulations. Much more muted colors, but again, very cool colors that you could just deliver straight out of camera. OK, check. That was the, that was the commercial stuff. So I thought, OK. What flash did you use? Uh, that was actually an old Metz flash. <laughs> that was what I had at the time. And I used some old cactus uh, triggers. And uh, then I had one flash coming from here, and then I had one lying on the ground from down there. And that was it. Quarter power, I think, something like that. It was getting quite dark at that time. So yeah, we went to Iceland. I had to test it out for landscape shooting. So um, I don't know if anyone has been to Seljalandfoss, but that place is one of the wettest places on Earth. 
I mean, it just it pours in with water constantly. And the camera is weather sealed. The, I still have the prototype at home, and I mean, it's not corroded yet, and it's been more than six months, so I'm perfectly sure this is this is fine. Um, another great thing about the landscape photography was when I mounted the Twin 24, then I could tilt it to the side, so I could get this really nice view for the for the tall waterfalls, and then I could use the flip screen that now flips horizontally as well. Um, so I didn't have to again bend over, strain my back. I could mount it on my tripod and just look at it like this. Pretty convenient. We walked to the famous DC-3 plane that Justin Bieber decided to surf on. So now the, the farmer that has this land decided to shut it down for the tourists. So we had to walk five kilometers. Um, and when we got there, I mean, suddenly there was a hailstorm in the horizon and the temperature just dropped rapidly. Again, the weather ceiling, no condensation, no nothing. It just works. And this is just an example, waterfall, very well hidden. We had to walk a lot down there. And again, the lightness of the system just made it a breeze to carry around instead of logging around with a big DSLR. <coughs> Dynamic range, I could really just crush the highlights in the sky. The sun was there. And then just bring out all the shadow details to, to kind of mimic all the, the small details that you see in the cliffs. Um, really great dynamic range. This was, take, this was converted from raw. I mean, there's, there's a lot of dynamic range that has to be crushed this way. Yep, and again, um, ND filter. I was there at the right time, just quarter past noon, where the sun was just right. So that was more luck than anything else, I guess. That's a great looking church. Yeah, you have to have a picture of a snail, right? Um, just again to show the, the low angle shots with the, with the tilt screen, it's very, very easy. Um, and you don't strain your back. I used that approach, that was not yet. That was not yet. <laughs> that was definitely not yet. <laughs> okay, here we go. For street photography, I like that view you get from waist level, where you get that epic kind of view, where you, almost like a rock band kind of thing. I know a lot of people think that when they see a, a shot like this, yeah, he's just shooting from the hip. He, he doesn't want to get noticed. And again, I don't care if that's the technique you want to use, use it. I just like the way the image looks. A wide angle shot from the waist, it makes this guy look incredibly powerful and proud, um, which is wanted, what I wanted to show here. If you go along, fiddling with your camera like this with the uh, with the X-T2, with the, with the flip screen, nobody will notice that you're taking their image. It just looks like you're fiddling with your camera. So you don't have that eye contact. It makes it quite easy to stay unnoticed on the streets. Now we can go talk about the GFX. Okay, so there are a lot of people in the world right now that has a lot more to say about this camera than I have. I only touched it briefly at Fotokina, um, but I just wanted to say a little bit about it today. I mean, this is a new generation from Fujifilm. They just skipped the full, uh, the whole full frame thing and went straight to medium format. And they took all of the XDNA, uh, all the buttons and all the, the manual controls and all the things that I really love about the X series and they just put it into that beast. Um, it's a big sensor. This is my wrist. <laughs> um, it's big. It's uh, a 40, almost 44 by 33 millimeter sensor. So it's a, it's a crop medium format sensor. Um, it's about 50 megapixels, 51 point something. Um, so you get that nice uh, new resolution, which is going to be really great for those of you who are doing commercial photography, who are using portrait photography. Uh, that's going to be really great. What surprised me was it had really low weight. It doesn't weigh anything, um, which is really great. Um, it, I think it's actually lighter than a D810, and it's actually smaller than a D810, just to name one of the cameras. Um, there it is in the hand with, with a, with a 50, 63 millimeter lens, f2.8. Uh, Fujifilm has, in the lens roadmap, announced uh, six different lenses. Um, that's going to come out in the near future. Um, they're relatively 
bright. I mean, they have relatively large apertures. There are 2.8 lenses. There's actually announced a, a 2.0 lens. So what this means is it's not just a, an f4 point something gain that you have to bring to your studio, put it on a tripod, carry the big tripod into the field, or just log it around the studio. You can actually, and this is what I think is quite incredible, you, can, you could probably do documentary stuff with this one because you can have fast shutter speeds because of the, the fast aperture. You can reduce the shake in the, in the, uh, in the high resolution sensor. So I'm, I'm personally looking forward to seeing what professional documentary photographers can do with this because they might go with this one instead of a full frame DSLR because it's the same size and weight. Um, so that's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, you probably know this guy. Um, he's a nice guy, by the way. Um, he, he, he had something to say with this. Uh, we talked about one thing that was great about this, and it's the fact that it has, in the lens mount, it has 12 pins, electrical pins. Um, what that may be, I'm not saying, this is again my guessing, because SAG wouldn't tell me anyone, no one would tell me. But I'm thinking, that makes it possible to adapt a whole lot of lenses, a whole lot of old lenses. So if you have an old medium format, you can probably, with the right adapter, adapt that. And because it has 12 pins, which is more than any of the other brands, you can probably communicate. So you can probably make it use the uh, leaf shutter that are in some of the lenses and then just override the focal plane shutter that, in, that is in this. That's just my guessing, which would be very clever because a lot of people that are going to use this is the ones that actually use the medium format already. So I think that's a clever decision. I'm just waiting to see if this, this holds through. So we'll see. And that brings me to the final chapter of this, adaptation. Um, it's a big passion of mine, these vintage old lenses that you can put on the mirrorless cameras. Um, you can use these adapters, put them on the camera, and then just use the manual focusing, and you can use it just like you would back in the 70s or 60s or whatever. <coughs> when I started this, that was back in 2012 with the X-Pro1, as I told you. There wasn't any information available. I mean, you had the Micro Four Thirds system. That was a real, mic uh, a real mirrorless system that, has been, that had been doing some of this, but I couldn't really find any info, so I started blogging about that. And, um, and I really, it just piqued my interest and I thought, okay, this is such a great world. I just, I need to share it with people. So that's actually the, the foundation of why I'm still blogging and it was the foundation of, of my photo blog. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. So how is this made possible? It's made possible with adapters and I have, I've brought a few. So an adapter is basically just, it's a distance piece, right? Because what it's all about is the flange back distance um, of, these, of these cameras. The flange back distance is the distance from where you mount your lens to the sensor or film plane. And in the old days, or with a modern DSLR, you need room for the mirror. So you have a large flange back distance. With the mirrorless cameras, you have a short flange back distance because you don't have to have a mirror. So what you just need, you just basically need a hollow tube with the right distance and then with the right mount for the old lenses on the front and then the uh, Fujifilm mount at the back and then you can mount whatever lens you want to. Popular adapters, at least for me, are the old Minolta ones and the M42 ones, uh, Leica, uh, the R lenses, the Contax lenses, and even some of the modern EOS lenses you can adapt using this. Leica can also be adapted because it's still a mirrorless system, but there's a little bit longer flange di back distance. So the adapters are only one centimeter thick, and f that's the only one that Fujifilm produces by themselves. Um, and they even put in some electronics so you can access a menu and correct for uh, vignetting and stuff like that. But these short, um, these short adapters makes it so that the lenses doesn't really look like they're too big. It just make, it looks at, it makes it look quite natural. 
And then you can get the Kippon adapter down there. That's just one of them. It's a helicoid adapter, so that makes it possible to just, you can tweak the adapter itself. So you can move the lens a little bit further away, and then you can bring the close focusing uh, in a little bit. B because typically the old rangefinder lenses, they would only focus to about a meter or something. Um, but with this one, you can make it focus down to 30 centimeters. So when you hit the near focus, you just bring in your adapter, and then you have sort of a macro effect on the lens. That's really good. This is an example. Uh, this is taken using this lens, an old uh, Canon lens, um, an old, uh, it's called the Japanese Summerlux. It's an old 50mm uh, f1.4 um, with, a, with a Leica mount, a, a screw mount. And you can mount that onto one of these close uh, adapters. Um, it has this great sharpness. It's really, really sharp, but it has this great fall off into this blurry kind of bokeh kind of thing. And you probably recognize this guy. He's the guy behind the video camera. This is Pelle, and if you don't know him, you need to know him because he's really good. Uh, so he does video, he does photography, and yeah, he's a genius. Sorry, he is. So this just goes to show, this is a non-cropped image. You can just zoom a little bit further in. So now you can just fill the entire frame with just, just the, the little rotation of the adapter. And I know I missed the focus on the eye, but we're not talking about that. So, then there was some clever engineer, and now I'm warning you, because now it's going to get really geeky. <laughs> there was a clever engineer, probably, who thought, okay, well, this distance piece, maybe we should put some glass into it. And what he did was, or what they did, or whoever did that, decided to make an inverted teleconverter. That's actually what this is. It's called a speed booster or a focal reducer. Or what it does, if you take a teleconverter, what it typically does is it multiplies your focal length with about 1.4, something like that. Or you can get a two times teleconverter. But with the 1.4, you lose a stop of light, right? You lose an f-stop of light. What the reverse one does is that it multiplies your focal length with 0 0.7 ish, something like that. So it goes the opposite way. So it actually makes the lens wider. And what you gain by that, it's the exact opposite of a teleconverter. So you gain a stop of light. You gain an extra stop of light. Just think of it as, I don't know if, I know I did, I'm not proud of it, but when I was a kid, I was burning ants with magnifying glasses. It's the same kind of thing. You, you condense the light onto the sensor, so you get a brighter image that, hit, that hits the sensor. That's actually basically the physics behind it. So, a small example of this would be if I had a 50 millimeter f1.4, a full frame lens, an old lens, and I mounted it onto one of these uh, speed boosters. It would multiply it with 0 0.7. So you would go from a, 30, from a 51.4 to a 35 millimeter f 0 0.98 because it gathers more light because you simply just have to multiply it all by 0 0.7 and then you put it onto the APS-C sensor of the Fuji and you have to again multiply it with 1.5 and that makes it a 52 f 1.5 so you're almost back to square one with the 50 1.4 so what this does is actually it just it basically says well you get what's on the lens in terms of depth of field, in, in terms of how small a depth of field you can get, right? But it has a great benefit because it, it gathers more light. So even though you have a depth of field of 1.5 or 1.4, you actually gather light as 0 0.9, which makes it possible for you to increase your shutter speed, so you get less shake. So you actually get a little bit of a better camera than a full frame camera when you use these. An example. Old Fujinon lens from the 80s, a 55 f1.8 through a speed booster. And you can clearly see wide open focuses on the eye and it just, it's just narrow depth of field. It's a, it's a true f1.4 depth of field. So why do I do this? <laughs> I mean, these old lenses, they have these imperfections and 
they just bring something to my photography that I cannot emulate digitally. They have different uh, conversions from black to white. They have, sometimes they have busy, weird out of focus areas. Sometimes they have some blurriness when it goes from harsh light to uh, dark shadow. And it's all these little imperfections. Uh, the flare as well, you can have some wild flares. And these imperfections make a great image. It's, it's, when you get a, an image that's too perfect, it's boring. So these little imperfections, that's what makes a, an image stand out. Um, this combines perfectly with the film simulations of Fujifilm, especially the Acros, where you get this grain control and this emulation of older film type kind of stuff. So when you combine the film simulations of Fujifilm with these, um, with these lenses, you get something really, really great. This is taken a week ago uh, with the Helios. Uh, the Helios uh, 44M is an old Russian lens that was produced in millions. Um, so there are a lot of them and that means they're really cheap. Um, when you find them at a local thrift shop, you can probably get them for 50 kroner or something like that. Mm. On eBay, it's getting more and more popular, so probably 350 kroner, something like that. Quality control back then was not good, so you have to probably buy seven and sell some on to, to get one that's a, a great quality one. Um, what the Helios has is it has this swirl. It, it's called optical vignetting. It's when, you, when you're close to the center, the out-of-focus highlights, they're perfectly round. But then because of the, the, the depth of the lens, when you move to the side, it becomes more cat-eyed. So it's, it's almost uh, elliptical out there. <coughs> And what that does to your entire image is it makes the entire image just swirl around your subject. So if you want to do something really cool, if you're a wedding photographer, buy a Helios, buy a speed booster, mount it, and then just take them into a forest on a sunshiny day with the sun going through all the leaves, place them in the middle, and then just watch all that bokeh just swirl around them in the middle. That's, that's going to impress them, that's for sure. The flare. I mean, this is some Michael Bay kind of stuff, right? Um, this is an old 40 millimeter uh, Sumicron lens made for, uh, for Leica CL and Minolta also made a version for the Minolta CLE. Um, it has this wild flaring where you get, uh, it just, it flares all over the place. And I mean, if you want to do something really cool, you just make a cinematic crop and you have a movie, right? So you can, do some great dramatic uh, stuff that you cannot do with, uh, with your normal lenses. Usually you mount these onto the cameras that have an EVF because you need the EVF to see where you're focusing. You don't have any controls uh, so you can see where your focus is at. This changed a little bit um, with, the, uh, with the X-Pro2. Uh, and the X100S, that was the first one that had, no, the T. Um, you could do a small flip to one of the sides and instead of a full EVF, you could actually get a small center window with the EVF representation of what you had there. Um, so you get the optical viewfinder and then you get the uh, electronic viewfinder where you can put your focus highlight peaking on so you can see where you're focusing even when you're using the optical viewfinder. This is, this is really great and, and, and that's why I can use all these manual focus lenses on my X-Pro2. The X-T2 has something similar because it has such a big EVF. It has a mode where you can split it so you have the large screen to your left and then you have the small sensor window just zoomed in right next to it. You can see the both side by side at the same time. And that's because it has this big screen that you can do that. And then again, I just thought I would end this with a sunset because now I'm done. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming out and listening to all of my weird ramblings about vintage lenses and, and my street photography and what moves me in the world of Fujifilm. Um, so thank you very much for coming out.